My name is Molly Martin, and I'm with New America. I'm the director of New America's work in Indianapolis. New America is a nonpartisan nonprofit think tank based in Washington, DC, but I live here. Indianapolis has been home for almost 20 years, and my work focuses on the Midwest. Today, we're coming together for the fifth in a series called COVID-19 in the Black Community. It's a partnership between New America and the Indianapolis Recorder. For those of you tuning in from across the country, the Indianapolis Recorder is one of the nation's oldest and most trusted Black newspapers, and we're truly honored to have their partnership. One of the reasons we come together for this series is we know that Black voices are critical to everything that we do. And they have to be included in conversations about public policy, public problem solving in all aspects of our lives. There are some other kind of ground rules or acknowledgements that we like to make before we have conversations about the Black community here at New America Indianapolis. One is Black voices are critical. The other, systemic racism and biases impact every aspect of our personal, social, and economic lives, including our individual health. Black Lives Matter. Race and ethnicity are different. The Black community is not a monolith. And we seek to be clear in our language. So as we talk today, we're going to be talking about wealth, income inequality, and lots of things that tend to bring up words like vulnerable or marginalized. And we try to be clear about what we mean by that. Sometimes that marginalization or vulnerability comes from a larger system. Sometimes it comes from personal circumstance. And I know all of my speakers will be crystal clear about that. Uh, speaking of my speakers, I have a really motley crew, a bunch of very busy people who've taken time out to be with us today. And I could not be more thrilled. I wanna take a moment to introduce them before I introduce and hand over to my excellent co-moderator. Uh, with us today, we have Dr. Brianka Merritt, who is the director of the Center for Research and Inclusion in Social Policy at the IU Public Policy Institute. Uh, I also have Mr. John Thompson. Now, Mr. John Thompson is CEO, founder, and uh, the chair of many companies here in Indianapolis. He's kind of the chair of the whole city, uh, to name a few, Thompson Distribution Incorporated and First Electric. We'll hear a little bit more about Mr. Thompson soon. Hello, Mr. Thompson. Uh, we also have Marlon Jackson, who is the founder and CEO of Revive Property Group and of the uh, Fight for Life Foundation. We'll hear more about that soon. As an Indianapolis resident, I also have to point out that yes, it's that Marlon Jackson who made that catch that took the Colts to the Super Bowl. And so we thank him for that as well as his uh, social contributions. Uh, we also have Emil Aguirre. Um, Emil is going to tell us a little bit more about the GEO Foundation. He's the direct executive director of strategic partnerships there. He also is the driving force behind InnoPower. And InnoPower has been one of the central partners in designing this series. And so we're really happy to have Emil with us. Um, I do want to say briefly that as we talk about wealth today, we're going to ask for your feedback. Today is not just meant to be a conversation between the people you see on screen, but a conversation between all of us. So as Angela said, we hope that you'll use the chat, participate in some polls, and ask some good questions. I'd like to hand over to my excellent co-moderator and partner, Oshia Boyd, who is the editor of the Indianapolis Recorder and Indiana Minority Business Magazine to say some more about today's topic. Oshia? Thank you so much, Molly. And thank you to all the panelists for joining us today this, for this very important conversation. Um, the Recorder is 125 years old, as you mentioned. So wealth building is really important to us in our community. Um, I think I'm hoping that with this interactive discussion, which I think will be really fun because we've never done that before. Um, so I, what I will hope that is today that we unpack wealth versus being rich. What's the difference? Because um, there are differences. Um, Hopefully we also discover ways to build wealth and how building wealth, how that impacts the black community in Indianapolis and as well as in the United States. How does that actually help us? How do we pass wealth down from generation to generation? Um, so those are kind of things and why wealth is so important, why we are having this conversation. So those are some of the things I'm hoping that this conversation will um, illuminate for us today. Uh, <laughs> I'm hoping, I, I feel like it will. I feel like we have some really big we have some really heavy hitters here in this conversation, so we're going to have a really great discussion, and I'm hopeful that people that are out there listening will ask some good questions and participate, and as Molly said, make sure you use the chat. We want to hear from you. We definitely want to make sure that you are a part of this. I feel like it's really innovative today. <laughs> so thank you so much. Back to you, Molly. Thank you, Oshia. So I'm going to uh, press on my colleagues in DC to help us with something. We want to start by understanding where you and the audience are coming to this conversation. And so we've developed a brief poll. And um, Angela and Jason, you should see a poll appear on your screen with three questions. The first is, I feel that median black wealth is growing in this country. And you can answer yes, no, or somewhat. Two, I believe that owning a home or land is a good indicator of wealth. 
And then the third question is a little more specific. I'm accustomed to seeing black faces in decision-making roles in banks. And if you're having trouble with the poll at all, you can feel free to respond to those same questions in the chat. So thank you so much to my colleagues in DC. Um, with that, as the results come in and we get some feedback on those, we do want to kick off. And I'm going to start by actually asking each of our panelists to take a moment, uh, and Oshia, you too, because you are, um, you're not getting off the hook, uh, and tell us a little bit about your personal journey to success. So start by telling us kind of who you are. I, I mentioned an introduction and then briefly tell us how you got here, because one of our conversations today is going to be be about black excellence and black pathways to multi-generational success. With that, uh, Dr. Merritt, Brianka, I'm going to start with you first. Could you tell us a little bit about what you do and your journey? All right, thanks, Molly. Um, so I guess I'll start by just kind of reiterating my title. I'm director of the Center for Research on Inclusion and Social Policy, also known as CRIS, um, at Indiana, Indiana University and our affiliated Public Policy Institute. Um, I am a native Southerner. Uh, lived in Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma, and so this is my first foray into the Midwest. Um, I can't say that I've been just super successful in traditional terms. Um, I am an academic and a question, curiosity, problem solver type person, so I would say just my personal journey, um, as you're talking about um, in the premise of wealth building as well, that um, I'm fortunate to have grown up around um, a Black community that has been um, with a variety of different socioeconomic and educational levels. So I was exposed really early to kind of pique my curiosity in the area of politics and government and problem solving and disparate outcomes. And so having those opportunities very early on really helped me kind of solidify my interests, what I do. Um, I've had quite a few setbacks in terms of, um, you know, pursuing higher education. I do have a PhD, but it came with a lot of bumps. Um, at one point completely um, what we would call almost like flunking out of a program and uh, kind of rebounding and being able to uh, complete that. And similarly with my story um, as director, I started out um, kind of taking whatever kind of job I could get um, and working my way up over the past few years um, through support and just uh, being patient, waiting for opportunities during that time. So it's kind of a very brief overview um, of kind of uh, what I do and generally where I've come from. Thank you so much, Priyanka. Emil, I'm going to come to you next. Uh, Mr. Ikeor, Emil, I'd love to hear a little bit about what you do and how you got here. Go ahead and unmute yourself for us. Thank you so much, Molly. Um, I was born in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, grew up in a, in a house of um, seven sisters and two brothers. Um, and I'm um, one day, my parents decided it was a good idea for me to um, leave Nigeria and come to the States to pursue educational opportunities. So I left my family in, um, in Lagos when I was 15, um, moved to Daytona Beach, um, Florida, to stay with a family I had never met before, and um, really just got exposed to a whole lot once I came to the U.S. Um, keep in mind, when I was in um, Nigeria, um, I was never called a black person, right? Um, I'm a jaw by nature, that's the tribe I'm from, and everybody's pretty much identified based on their culture. Um, not until I came to the U.S. was I identified based on my skin color, right? Um, so that was something I had to get used to, but I um, came to the States um, when I was 15, and, re and really, I remember coming to the U.S. full of excitement. I was coming to America, and um, everything I had watched on TV and read about the U.S. was what I was coming to. Um, so I came to the States and I um, remember getting here and um, a lot of my friends that I met saying that a lot of my friends didn't have a similar excitement about being in the U.S., um, a lot of my African-American friends. Um, back then, I didn't understand why. I was 15. I just I wasn't well versed in all the historical issues in the country here. Um, but years later, um, I got exposed to football when I was in high school. Um, played one year of football my senior year, ended up getting a scholarship to the University of Central Florida in Orlando, played four years there. Um, was lucky enough to get into the NFL, um, ended up getting six years in the NFL, 
um, retired. My wife is from Indianapolis, and um, made a promise that once I retired, we're going to move here to to Indy. Um, so moved to Indy. Um, my son was born here. Um, Nineteen years, eighteen years later, he graduated from Cathedral High School. He is now a student athlete at the University of Alabama. Um, so today, what I what I do um, in education, I, I'm the national executive director of the Geo Foundation. Um, we manage schools across the country, but with a focus on innovation, um, with a focus on how do we accelerate how young people learn today, especially young people who are not as exposed or who don't have the resources we all have. How do we make sure that uh, we're not holding kids back, but we're looking towards the future and making sure that we are pushing the needle in everything we do. So we have a dual enrollment model. All of our students are able to take college courses in high school that we pay for. Um, majority of our students in Gary, Indiana are graduating with AA degrees and college credits. So the whole focus of what, what I do as an individual, I say, is um, focus on how as a black community um, here in the U.S. and also sub-Saharan Africa, how are we doing things in a different way? How are we solving problems or creating opportunities in a different way from education to entrepreneurship? Um, so that's really, um, once I got done playing football, I had to find something that gave me the same excitement about playing, and I think I found it. So I wake up every day thinking of um, how do we do things differently today in our communities? How do we solve problems or create opportunities in a different way? Thank you so much. Thank you, Emil. Um, I'm going to pivot now to Mr. John Thompson. Mr. Thompson, you have uh, quite a storied history in, in business and founding and, and academics. Tell us a little bit about your journey and what you do today. Make sure and unmute for us, Mr. Thompson. Thank you. T today, I uh, operate several businesses and then invest in, in many others. And uh, typically, the businesses that I invest in, I have some either board role or, in, or some role as an influencer in those businesses. But then I own and operate four companies myself. And those companies, um, I'm a distributor uh, in two companies, one electrical supplies and another one mechanical supplies. And I'm selling to a fair amount to construction, to the construction industry. And then I'm also selling to institutional industrial maintenance facilities. I have an engineering design firm and I'm an engineer by undergraduate training. And, uh, and then fourthly, I manufacture and install uh, millwork items, wood, solid surface, plastic laminate items, uh, uh, solid surface you might know as Corian, but many other manufacturers have that product other than DuPont. And so we, we fabricate and install those products. I'm fortunate right now, all of my companies are essential businesses, so they are operating, operating safely. Uh, in a healthy and safe, safe fashion. I moved here 35 years ago from New York City. Um, I went to undergraduate school upstate New York at Cornell. That's what got me to New York. And while it's upstate, not in the city, many of the students are from the city. So you tend to spend a lot of time in New York City. And then um, between undergraduate and graduate school, I worked selling chemicals up and down the East Coast. And um, again, uh, it worked out of the New York sales office, New York City sales office that eventually moved to Connecticut. And then, you know, I always knew I'd go back for an MBA. Um, and I think you've heard that theme from the speakers today uh, education is a big part of, you know, how they've gotten to where they are now. So I knew from an un early in my undergraduate years that I would go back for an MBA. And after three years of selling chemicals, I did that. And I uh, went to Columbia. So again, in New York City. Uh, and um, after which I, I uh, worked in management consulting 
in New York and London at McKinsey and Company uh, doing management consulting, mainly to process industries, chemicals, oil and gas, pulp and paper. Although I was educated in New York, I was born and raised in Baltimore. So my public school education was in Baltimore. And there I grew up uh, very poor in, uh, you know, financial wealth and financial resources, but very rich in family, culture, and uh, neighborhoods that provided a wealth of fun growing up and opportunities for uh, growth and advancement. So I grew up in two public housing projects at the same time. One is Lexington Terrace, which is the basis for the wire. And the other is Perkins, which is the basis for homicide life on the street. But growing up, in those projects was very, very different than growing up outside of them and coming into them. So um, the danger that you see in those projects, I didn't have as much as someone who came in from outside. And there were a lot of resources around them that fed into young people if they took advantage of it. And um, my grandfather, who lived in Lexington Terrace, that's who I lived with there, my grandparents, he always encouraged me, uh, even when I got in trouble, he encouraged me. Uh, my mother, who I lived with at the same time in Perkins with my siblings, Emil, uh, two brothers and five sisters, not, not seven sisters. <laughs> um, we lived together in Perkins and my mother was like my grandfather, very encouraging. And there was a mission church in my community, East, uh, uh, Eastern Stars, my church today. It was St. Augustine Lutheran Church. And that pastor Hans Goebel really fed into and worked with young folks that wanted to work with him. And I didn't start out wanting to, we started out in a, in a way that, you know, it's unfortunate, but no matter what I did to him, he never gave up on, me. never. And um, eventually I came around and he had a huge impact on my life. I always planned to go to college, but he uh, kind of opened doors to different colleges and scholarship opportunities that I may not have otherwise taken advantage of. But I knew from a young age that I was an entrepreneur. So at eight years old, I worked for myself on horses and wagons, selling fruits and vegetables throughout the neighborhoods in Baltimore. And they still have that today. It's called a rabbit. So if you go to Baltimore, you're going to see colorful horses pulling wagons through neighborhoods loaded with fruit, vegetables, sometimes fish and flowers and other items. And I did that and the more I sold, the more I earned. And then I did other things like work at a supermarket to make money. And so even in, in school, even though I studied chemical engineering, I knew that I wanted to own my own business. And that's how I got to Indianapolis. I came out here to uh, join Bill Mays and work at Mays Chemical Company with the idea of going back to New York City and opening up my own business there as a chemical distributor. And we had so much fun at Mays Chemical that when three years came and passed uh, and I stayed out here and stayed at Mays Chemical for over 17 years before I bought my first company. And so as we talk today, and, 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 and I'll shut up to, to, to give the, the next speaker a chance, you, you'll learn that, that I believe that education and entrepreneurship is certainly a way to build wealth. And, uh, and it's not a luck of the draw. You, you can plan it very carefully and ensure your success. So that's all I have to say for now.
Thank you so much, Mr. Thompson. What a story. What a story. I'm going to go next to, to Marlon Jackson, to Mr. Jackson, to hear a little bit about his journey. And you've got a couple of projects going all at once now. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Thank you, Molly. Um, I grew up um, like John in the housing projects. I was born in Youngstown, Ohio, uh, lived in Briar Hill projects and moved and grew up um, in Western Pennsylvania, Sharon, Pennsylvania. Um, I grew up in a toxic stress field environment. Uh, I grew up during the 80s, um, during the crack epidemic um, in America. And my mother was strung out um, on crack, you know, all during my time of growing up. Um, and my father was never, never around. Um, you know, I experienced a lot of neglect um, and high rate of poverty and moved uh, from home to home. Um, my mother was incarcerated in third grade and I had to go and live with my grandmother. Um, I went from living with my grandmother back to my mother and eventually in sixth grade ended up being taken in um, by an aunt and uncle. Stayed with them for a few years, they divorced, and then I ended up living with just my aunt. Um, stayed with her uh, up until, I believe, ninth grade, and then I was taken in and lived with another uncle. Stayed there for some time and, and eventually ended up living with my high school football coach. Um, during this time, you can imagine it's kind of hard to um, find yourself. We didn't have as many resources as John mentioned in the housing projects that he grew up in. You know, it, it was a uh, lacking of male role models um, and they're just upstanding, you know, citizens and people that are contributing to society and not, you know, uh, um, a part of the system and on welfare and not really having a, a path for themselves. Um, but during that time, you know, I've kind of found my way through athletics. Um, I had an older brother. El Marco, who, who many people would say is a much better athlete than myself. Um, I grew up watching him and idolizing him on the football field. Um, and because of him, I grew to, to have a passion for athletics, for football. Um, watching him lose his football career from the streets um, was one of the early valuable lessons that I learned um, and really learning your lessons in life and when you have an opportunity, taking advantage of it. Um, you know, and I took advantage of my opportunities and began to value education because it was something through athletics. Athletics gave me focus and I knew that if I wanted to be on that football field, I had to have those grades as well. Um, so it, it really gave me focus and it had me hone in on what was possible. And for me, when I couldn't see a way out, it was my my light um, in a dark tunnel. Um, and in that time, I grew, I grew to go on to be um, an All-American in high school, receive a scholarship from the University of Michigan, and go on to receive numerous accolades at the University of Michigan as an All-American, be voted as team captain, eventually graduate uh, from the University of Michigan, go on to the NFL, being drafted by the Indianapolis Colts in the first round um, of the NFL draft, winning the Super Bowl, playing for Coach Tony Dungy, um, learning invaluable life lessons on leadership and on culture um, during my time with Coach Dungy. Um, and in that same, and in that same time, um, really finding my true passion. I was a really extremely passionate football player, but I, I grew to learn that I was even more passionate about underserved individuals and underserved communities. Um, looking back at where I had come from and everything that I had experienced, and reflecting and thinking about how how could I have made it through this these obstacles with the right resources and then seeing how can I put something together through business to help those that are in the same uh, conditions and facing the same barriers that I was able to overcome. Um, so I began my work with the Fight for Life Foundation, founding the organization, establishing it during my playing days with the Indianapolis Colts. Um, from the Colts, I went on to the Philadelphia Eagles, injured there, Football career is over, so I went into formalizing the Fight for Life Foundation and turning it into a true nonprofit. Um, and in my time of building out my work with social emotional learning, developing the minds of underserved youth, um, I, I began to kind of um, search for another path in entrepreneurship, um, and, and it led me to to real estate uh, development and uh, a niche niche market where my, my focus is affordable housing and supportive housing solutions. A lot of the things that I needed growing up um, as a youth, a lot of the things that my mother needed growing up um, as an as an addict and trying to overcome her traumatic experiences. Um, I've also expanded upon my entrepreneurial endeavors as well with a, with a new joint venture called RCRA Revive Community Regenerative 
intensive agriculture, um, you know, bringing um, urban agriculture to the urban urban setting, urban community, um, and producing high quality, nutritious uh, produce, um, whatever we're getting off the ground right now. And I also um, have my own branding company, Marlin J28, which I do public speaking through as well. Um, but, you know, for me, you know, I'm, I'm very purpose driven. Um, everything that I've been able to overcome, I only I know that I've only been able to do it through Jesus Christ. Um, so, you know, in coming from where I've come from and being where I am, um, it, it's not my life. You know, it, it, it's, it's for a greater purpose and everything that I've experienced is for a greater purpose. And I live that way with that intention each and every day. And now, you know, as I have my own family, my wife, Nikki, and my boys, Camden, Kingston, and Cash, I think about legacy and not just the legacy of my family, but the other young uh, black and brown, you know, fit male and females that are growing up and providing opportunity for them as well. Thank you so much, Marlon. Um, Oshia, we're going to come to you for the big finish. And I, I think you are also not originally from Indianapolis. This might be the first panel we've had where we have a lot of who've, who've moved to town and transplanted. So Oshia, tell us a little bit about your journey. Well, I don't know how I can follow Marlon. <laughs> I don't know how I can follow that. That was, yeah. Now I feel like, man, I, I haven't done much in my life. <laughs> and by the way, Dr. Mayor, I see we are twinning here. I just realized that we, I was sitting there looking at you. We are actually twinning. I was going to wear red and my red lipstick, but I changed my mind. So we would have been exact twins. <laughs> well, I've been in journalism now for about 24 years. Um, started out, uh, well, I knew I wanted to be a journalist in elementary school. So um, started out in high school in yearbook and newspaper, went to college, um, I uh, actually met an editor of the newspaper. I'm from Muncie originally, Muncie, Indiana originally. So I met the editor at high school at a, a Rotary Club luncheon. Our econ class won a Rotary Club uh, competition and we got to go to lunch with the Rotary Club. So anyway, I uh, met him and he, and I told him I had an interest in journalism. He gave me his card and said, give him a call. Being a senior, I was a little nervous. I didn't do it. Um, never. Then fast forward a couple of years, he's, my, he's one of my instructors in J school journalism school. So I walked up to him one day and I said, hey, I met you a few years back and you told me <laughs> I might be able to get a job at the paper. And he said, oh yeah. So there, I got a job. I started being a copy clerk. Um, that position no longer exists. Exists, exists, exists. Gosh, I couldn't get that word out <laughs> um, in this industry anymore. It's uh, So I started off doing news briefs, making coffee. I actually made coffee for people starting out in my career. Um, we'll come in every day about four, make coffee and start doing news briefs, did obituaries, um, local stats in the newspaper, eventually got to write a couple of stories. And I thought that was really big when I got to write a couple articles and saw my name in the paper and tell everyone I know my family. I'm in the paper now, I work at the paper. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, my first full time job was actually at the recorder. So I started at the recorder as a full time reporter and, I, and at that time I was so very proud to I uh, have to work at a black owned newspaper. Um, I'm not from Indianapolis originally, like I said, so I, I'm from Muncie and it's close enough where we would hear commercials for the recorder. So I knew of the recorder's existence. I knew how prestigious it was. So to finally get there, I thought, oh yeah, I'm here now. <laughs> but I eventually did leave. I went back to my first newspaper um, and, and covered education for about eight years. I uh, did a couple other things there. Then I came and I worked at Angie's List in their magazine for their magazine for a few years. Um, then I ended up coming back to the recorder as editor. So so actually my life has kind of been recorder and the star press My pretty much my career. I've kind of stayed in two different places. Um, so came back as editor and for me it was the perfect opportunity to blend two of the things I'm very passionate about. I'm very passionate about a lot, but I'm very passionate about black people. Um, and I'm very passionate about journalism. I'm very passionate about doing excellent journalism. And I felt this was the opportunity for me to have an impact on our community, to actually educate our people, to um, th the three things I came with when I, when I started was, our story should educate, empower, and um, engage, and engage readers. So if we don't do all of those, a story should at least do one of those or two of those. But that's my goal is that we always educate, educate, empower, and engage so that we're giving our community vital information, things they need, 
and also to continue the legacy of this 125 year old newspaper. That's very important to me is to make sure that we have a standard of excellence, not just journalism, but as a black owned business as well. So when people look at the recorder, they can say, okay, I know they are actually um, holding themselves to a higher standard. I have a pretty high standard when it comes to what we put in the paper. Um, so that is, so that's kind of my journey. And that's, I'm just so very passionate about working at this newspaper. I don't think people in our community often understand how, how lucky we are, how blessed we are to have this paper. Um, every community does not have it. We are the fourth oldest. So that's saying something if we're the fourth oldest, um, cause we only have four that are this old. <laughs> so, um, and I, and like I said, I really want to empower our people, our community, give them information, help them understand things like this, help us navigate this world, help us understand why wealth is important, how to get there. These are the things that excite me about working at three quarter, the things I couldn't do if I worked for other publications. Thank you so much, Ashia, and thank you everyone for taking time to share your journey. The reason we think this matters, even in the face of a pressing national crisis, is we want to make sure that conversations about the, re the recovery and the resilience after COVID-19 don't just focus on deficit language, which is something that's come up in prior uh, programs that we've done with the Indie Recorder. We want to make sure that we tell stories of excellence and specifically tell stories of Black excellence uh, so that we can show the diversity of pathways to stability and multi-generational advancement. And, and we have a certainly interesting cross-section of stories here on screen with me today. One thing that stuck out to me while we were listening is all of you made some very deliberate decisions about the legacy you wanted to leave for your communities, for your children, uh, even for publications like The Recorder. And that requires a certain level of commitment, but also a certain level of barrier dodging. Um, I want to come to Brianna for a little bit because I want to dig in on some of the research about what we know about barriers. We'll, we'll ask some of you about the personal barriers you're encountered, but there are some systemic challenges that Black residents tend to face, although again, it's not a monolith, when they're trying to accumulate wealth. So Brianna, first I'm going to start with the question, what is wealth from an academic perspective? We've got some feedback from the audience. We've heard some people touch on it. What, do you, what is wealth as you would define it? I mean, I think wealth is, um, and I will not use a super academic phrasing around this, but I really think it's comfort. It's the ability to not worry about your current situation financially. I think it's about your parents or forebears not having to worry about it and your children not having to worry about it. So it's both multi-generational. I think wealth with a single person isn't really a thing. It's truly about what you've either built on or what you're building for somebody else, uh, both financially in terms of assets and other things as well. When we talk about how to measure that, uh, Brianka, because that's tricky. There are lots of non-monetary measures of wealth. We know that income is only one part of it. And you've heard stories of kind of greater stability and mobility uh, across all of your paths. What are some of the indicators that we look to when we want to talk about kind of the state of black wealth in Indiana, in the country, in Marion County? How do we measure yeah, yeah, so great question. I think it's tricky because I think in the black community, kind of to your point earlier, is that, um, you know, in terms of the barriers that we've had to face collectively in the US, that sometimes our definitions of wealth are a little different. And so I think kind of traditionally across racial ethnic groups, we do look at things like home ownership. Uh, we look at things like um, assets, things that might be in an IRA, IRA or a 401k or things like that, that are um, both liquid as well as something that can be um, kind of built upon um, and added to over time. Um, we also tend to focus on things that, of course, are not totally disposable. So, for example, we don't look at things like car ownership, but we would look at something that's a little more sustainable. Um, again, some of the problems with that is when we think about kind of what that means across communities is that, of course, um, it is skewed toward different types of opportunities, policies, et cetera, that consistently kind of advantage one group, in this case, uh, white Americans historically, than it does some of our black and brown communities here. So when we talk about kind of those historical impacts, some of those are policies and practices that are just based in, in institutional racism. Some of them are uh, policies that are colored a lot by implicit bias. Um, some of it is that there's a, a long way to catch up. Uh, white Americans have been able and permitted to develop wealth through ownership for a longer amount of time. And so what we know is that the net worth of a typical white family in 2016 was about $171,000. 
and the net worth of the typical black family in 2016 was $17,000. So it's about a 10 times difference. That's a huge difference. Um, another measure that I've seen, and this speaks, I think, to some of the research that you do, is the, the value of a home. Um, the, the value, the median value of homes in predominantly black neighborhoods, um, how much ownership of these kind of less disposable assets black families are kind of allowed to acquire. What have you seen in your research that speaks to home value in black America versus white America? Sure, I think overall, um, most of us probably know that black home ownership rates are lower than white home ownership rates, but um, even where we live certainly affects the value of our home. And a lot of those things aren't things that we can really control. So a lot of you might be familiar with the concept of redlining and the fact that, you know, decades and decades ago, there were policies in place to kind of concentrate black uh, individuals and households in particular areas. Those areas usually um, had real estate absent from homes that was a lower value, it might have been in a floodplain, it might have been in a place that was generally um, not desirable by other folks. And so what happens is over time, uh, we see concentrations of black people in particular neighborhoods. Um, what we found and what other folks have found nationally as well is that, um, you know, it's not about uh, the fact that black neighborhoods right now might have things like fewer amenities that lower their home value. It's purely the fact that the people who live there are black and it makes it less desirable um, for others to want to move in. So when we see those trends, um, I think it's important to note, I think you pointed this out very early on, Molly, is that with the words that we're using today, a lot of times we conflate disadvantaged and low income with being black. But black homeowners have been in a lot of these neighborhoods, again, for 60, 70 years. They've established a community there. So these aren't um, people who are kind of just scrapping for whatever, but those folks who are scrapping for whatever, quote unquote, are part of their families and part of their community as well. So we see these very diverse um, with regard to a lot of educational status, income, uh, being concentrated in these communities. But regardless of what's there and who lives there, we don't see the same amount of attention being focused on as, um, assets in terms of how to build up the neighborhood. So we don't see investments strategically, particularly in Indianapolis, around things like grocery stores um, and other opportunities, having uh, school systems and uh, that aren't charter schools, like where are the neighborhood schools in a lot of um, Indianapolis neighborhoods that are predominantly black too. So not only do we see kind of our home valuation um, being lower, we're also not seeing the same levels of investment that we might see in comparable neighborhoods where folks might be uh, predominantly white. I have a question. So as we're talking about home ownership in neighborhoods and individuals, but how does that then relate to the community at large? How does the community generate wealth if you are living in a neighborhood that um, you've been there for 50, 60 years, but your property values are not the same simply because this is a black neighborhood. So then how does this affect community wealth? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's about, um, you're just aggregating what an individual is experiencing. So I think to your point, it's community wealth in terms of assets, homes, et cetera, but it's community wealth in terms of, like I said, some of these other amenities. Um, you know, we don't usually think of school as an amenity, but yeah, being able to go around the corner and know that your child is going to get an education from an A-rated school in the state of Indiana is an amenity. And uh, we don't have that. So to your point about community wealth, it's not just kind of a one-time thing with homes, it's how it affects, uh, different types of opportunities in the community and then how that leads over into kids and future generations um, staying in that neighborhood and the opportunities that they have as well. So it's an individual thing, but if multiple individuals are experiencing the same things, um, that certainly is a community indicator for wealth too. That's a great question, Oshia. And actually a question back to all of you, to, to everyone on the panel. Does anything make you especially nervous? Hearing what Brianka just said about the disparity and looking around at the financial impact that COVID-19 is having on your neighbors, your friends, your family, on your readers, your clients. So I'm gonna look for kind of nodding heads and thumbs ups to see who wants to jump in. What are you worried about? Marlon, you look like you might have something to share. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about our, our youth, you know, um, where, you know, school has been a place to get away. Maybe it's a place where you get two meals, um, two meals a day. Um, and now th that, that environment is taken away from you. And not only is that environment taken away from you as a safe haven, um, but now you don't have access to technology. You don't have the Chromebook. You don't have the internet access. So there's no e-learning. So the, 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 the gap is, is widening. The margin is, is increasing um, with our, our children continuing to fall behind because there are already, you know, negative circumstances in terms of different social determinants of health 
and adver adverse childhood experiences and what COVID-19 is doing is just adding to what's already been existing in our community and making it even harder for us to acquire and obtain wealth um, and build a legacy for you know the young people coming up behind us um, and you know right now the gap is just widening you know because of COVID-19 and the lack of resources and then even with you know institutions that are putting together these different funds you know the funds aren't aren't being you know administered they're they're sitting on the funds trying to figure out what to do while people are in need of funds right now immediately you know so the, the more we wait and the, the less action taken you know the more our children are, are at risk of going down the wrong path because they don't have that stability that school can provide, even if it may not be the best environment, most times it's better than what's going on at home. That really underlines, Marlon, I, I think what Oshia and Brianka were just saying about school is an amenity uh, and school is a great wealth contributor. All of you talked about education as, as a pathway, but also the kind of structural and personal and social stability that schools, schools can provide. So, so one question that's come in from the audience, and John, I'm going to come to you, is about at a time like this during COVID-19, when you know that young people who were previously at risk are at greater risk and, and could be losing their opportunity to break a cycle of lack of wealth or a cycle of poverty, um, or even maintain their parents' current level of, of income and wealth, how do you reach back into the places you came from or, if, or reach over into neighborhoods that that are having a hard time. John, do you do you ever go back home to Baltimore? Do you mentor? Do you, um, how would you recommend people reach back at, or reach out to, to folks and kids in need? You know, you know, I'll, I'll make several comments. To, on, 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 you, you, you raise a point that covers a ver very, very wide spectrum. So first off, I do go back to Baltimore, um, you know, even though I grew up in housing. John, I think we lost you. Could you uh, hit unmute, please? Okay. Yeah, I grew up in 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 housing projects, and you know, you obviously don't own them. They're public. Uh, they're owned by the the city that you live in. But at any rate we had a sense of ownership and belonging. So in both my housing projects, we have a reunion every year. And so I'm very active, actively involved in that reunion. In one case, the project is still there. So I go back to that project. And then in the other case, while the project is not there, we do it in that neighborhood. So I'm back in uh, in Baltimore for that and then my family is still there I have uh, siblings the the vast majority of my family is in Baltimore so that gets me back and um, my family fortunately we took advantage of education and so the family while we for the most part moved up we have not completely so some you know we provide help to family but also to the neighborhood that I grew up in. So uh, one, I'm a big sponsor of our reunions. And two, I work with the young folks in those communities through various organizations that still take, that still exist there. And a lot of my friends who are still active in those communities bring me back for all kinds of things throughout the year because they're still very active in those communities, even though they may not live there. My brother still, you know, goes into those communities a lot and he keeps me very actively involved. But that's just one part of the part of, of the equation. I mean, because I'm from Baltimore doesn't mean that I have to help those in, in Baltimore, I'm responsible to help those wherever I am. So um, my original company that I bought, it's at 22nd and College, which is in a you know heavy black neighborhood in this city. Neighborhood's changing now, but still um, I've been in that neighborhood for 18 years. So a lot of what I do to help I do it right here in Indianapolis where, you know, tremendous help is needed in the black community. One of the ways, several of the ways that I find it, you can be more effective 
is working through professional organizations. So my effort is to give back to organizations that are then helping and giving and doing in those communities. And so United Way, I find to be a broad umbrella that helps you know, all of them in, 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 in many cases. But then there are others that are right there in the communities providing job training and other things like the Indianapolis Urban League, an affiliate of the, the National Urban League. And so I can give time, talent, and treasure there and have a major impact through an organization that really have a structured approach to giving back. Same with a Crystal Moore house that's working with young people. And so on this panel, you know, I think everyone here have benefited from education. Two of our panelists have used education to also advance in sports. And so uh, when I'm in, in, in an inner city uh, environment, I know I can reach and encourage young people through sports and particularly young black boys who are looking for some structured way of getting out of the out of the streets. I mean, um, you know, someone in the chat sent the chat about mentoring. I believe heavily in mentoring. And so I try to work with organizations that mentor. And if you're going to mentor young folks, that's even even better for me. So a couple examples of, of mentoring. Um, I'm president of the uh, Crossroads of America Scout Council. And we cover central Indiana from the Ohio border to the Illinois border. 15, 16 counties come under Crossroads. I'm chairman of the board, president of the board, which is like chairman you know, of, of the organization. And uh, to me, that's the best mentoring organization in the country. If you're going to ment mentor young people, it was just boys, now it's boys and girls. I was a Boy Scout uh, for many years, Cub Scout and Boy Scout, made a big difference in my life. And, um, you know, I believe that um, we have to make time to mentor. And if we don't, the gangs, they make plenty of time. They'll never turn a young person down. The gangs have time for them. You want to learn how to steal the car? Come on, I will show you how to steal the car, how to rob that person, how to rob that house, how to steal this. You've been thrown out of your house? You can live with me. You hungry? I'll feed you. Gangs will do all that. And they'll do it personally, hands on. And I believe that we have a responsibility to do that and give back wherever we are. It's kind of like church. I mentioned St. Augustine Lutheran Church helping me in Baltimore. But when I join church and give back to church, it's Eastern Star in Indianapolis, Indiana, who is where that's where I live today while they feed me uh, from a Christ biblical standpoint. I try to pump money into Eastern Star that it can then put back into the community. And Pastor Johnson does a better job of that than anyone, giving back in the community where it is needed. And so um, I know young folks want a better way. So when I say give to Crystal Moore House, Marcus Chapman over there and others, Willie Jake, they working with young people to box. And those young young guys, they go across the Midwest boxing, and they're not getting in any trouble. They're very active in their boxing. And some of them have gone on to the pros, but all of them go on to a structured and better life. So I believe in giving back time, talent, and treasure, all three, to the community and doing it in a you know, big and major way, but doing it in a structured way that helps. And so then in opening and starting businesses, you also ha have that opportunity. I'll say this and, and then I'll, you know, let someone else speak, but, you know, 
I got an award from the city called the Tease Me Award. Uh, and uh, Tamika Catching, she owns a tea shop, 22nd Street between Talbot and, and uh, Delaware. Um, and um, prior to that, um, Wayne owned that. He founded that tea shop. And back then, back in 2007, 8, 9, I would go in every Saturday from 10 to 2. People would always say, John, I want you to mentor me. I, I need some advice. And it was overwhelming because they'd want to do lunch. And, you know, it's only five lunch meetings a week that you can have. And so I said, well, I'll do 10 to 2 on Saturday. First come, first serve. Come on in to tease me, and we'll sit down, have a cup of tea, and talk. And uh, I haven't gone back to that. I did it for about four years. What I do now, when a person want to meet, I'll say, meet me at Tease Me. Of course, we're all shut down now with our social distancing. And maybe I'll go in at 2, 3, 4 in the afternoon through the week, which is just a couple blocks, four or five blocks from my office. And I can sit down and meet with people that want to talk about how they might structure and pursue business opportunities. I have so much more to say, but this isn't the John Thompson hour, so <laughs> I'll let someone else speak. Well, I think everyone's enjoying the John Thompson hour. I do want to yeah. add a brief pause, and I, Brown Kamerit, I know that you have uh, to speak at an engagement. Is there anything you'd like to share about wealth building, um, community support, communal support before you uh, have to leave us? Yeah, I think um, someone made a good point. I mean, we keep talking about education quite a bit, and I wanted to see, especially from the other speakers, about generational differences as well. Um, I think historically there's been a lot of focus on like the business community as a primary way of building wealth. So you see a lot of folks, especially younger people, trying to aspire to own multiple businesses. And I think that's kind of how we traditionally classify uh, not just wealth building, but success. And I think, again, given the slate of panelists that we have, um, similar uh, to Ms. Boyd, I also started off uh, trying to be a journalist when I grew up too. And so I think um, culturally, because we were so far behind for so many years in different areas, that there has not been, uh, there was such a concerted opportunity, particularly in the 70s, with more integration to kind of focus on getting a business degree, going into business. But I think revisiting this conversation, as someone said in the chat about what it means for teachers, what does it mean um, to do other types of professional, pursue other professional opportunities as a means of quote success or um, a way to get wealth. And I think the wealth conversation can sometimes get cloudy by that. So I think with a lot of millennials and even some Gen Zers, there's more of a focus on pursuing what you care about and sometimes it's at the expense of wealth, particularly in the short term, because I think a lot of younger folks are more interested in um, this idea of being at peace with what they're doing and pursuing something they love rather than um, you know, necessarily having the wealth or having the financial success. So I think we've seen a lot of those shifts over time, um, including, but there's also kind of, as we talk about these systemic things, how that's worked against us. So I think things like a lot of black folks who didn't have an education or a college degree will pursue things like manufacturing, other types of jobs. But obviously, like when we talk about the decline in manufacturing occupation, I think we may have lost Brianka for a minute. We'll give her a second, see if she comes back in. Well, I think if I can, if I can uh, interject, I think we, from uh, Mr. Thompson and uh, Ms. Merritt, we're, we're kind of unpacking a lot here. I think um, the idea of when we started, uh, Brianka said, wealth com is comfort. She'll describe it as comfort. And I think for so many of us, we think of comfort in the terms of money have enough money um, to buy my needs and then my wants is comfort. And then, um, and I like what Mr. Thompson was talking about when he was, we were talking about mentoring and and what he said so many things there, he he supported a black owned business, you know, and going to tease me, he, he was mentoring young people. So I think it's like wealth building seems to be like all of these things maybe, is that, does anyone have any, I see you shaking your head, emails, am I, am I like anywhere near that this is kind of what wealth building is, is we have to, we have to get 
like all these things together to actually create wealth for our family, ourselves, as well as our community. I totally agree. I think um, the common denominator with um, the panelists on here is um, we all started from zero, right? Um, we all started um, our careers going, going to college and getting a job and everything. We started from zero. Um, we didn't have anything passed down to us um, as far as the inheritance or even social capital. Um, we, if we look back at all of our careers and say, how great would it have been if um, we had somebody who had connections to open some doors for us, right? Or if we inherited a home um, that our parents passed down to us so we can have and start building our careers with. So I think for us and for me especially is looking to make sure that um, my son um, has that that I hand down to him. I hand down some connections, some social capital. I also hand down a home that he can start out with and also some dollars in an account somewhere for him. Um, in this country, I think um, a lot of Americans, I think, take everything for granted, I think, so much. Um, I come from a, um, a country where there's no social no social nets. I mean, there's no safety nets. Um, it's a cash-based economy. If you can't afford it, you can't buy it. Um, there's not a whole lot of credit available for you to do anything with. So when we look at wealth and we look at how generationally things have been passed down um, in certain cultures in Nigeria and Africa, it's based on what's passed down from your parents. Mm -hmm. um, what have your parents, what have your parents given to you? If it's knowledge, if it's connections, if it's land, in most cases, land is wealth. Um, and then here in the U.S., it's saying that um, as long as you are, you have the thinking or the feeling that you are one connection away or you're one class away of, from making it or one, um, one loan away from it. What happens is so many young black males, especially, don't have that level of hope. So many of them don't have those connections. So many of them don't have um, the aspirations to say, look, all I have to do is pass this class and I'm there because those opportunities don't exist today. So as we have this conversation, I think a lot of what we can neglect is the complexity of the black community. Um, meaning this, um, most of us, when we say the black community, we, we automatically relate to a portion of town that um, may not be doing as well as far as people, upper mobility is not accessible. And we say that's the black community, right? The problem with that is we have communities that the overwhelming mindset is, let me work hard or do what I have to do so I can get out of this community. Um, when you meet young people today, they want to go to school, get a degree or get a job so they can get out. Well, if everybody's living in that community, if everybody's looking to get out and everybody's aspiring to get out, how can we ever build? Because there's a lack of talent now, there's a lack of desire to build because everybody's doing their part to get out of that community. So a lot of times when I get into these conversations, um, we ignore the complexity of our community. That a lot of times, most of the people looking to solve problems in certain communities, black communities, don't stay in those communities, haven't stayed in those communities in years. So as black people also, we have to be careful that um, as we look to solve problems, as we look to relate to um, identify with a community because majority of the people in that community look like us, that we also don't come in and tell people what to do all the time. Um, we have to come in and understand the true complexity and really look at problem solving in a new way. The old way we all know, the old way just didn't work. <laughs> we see the results from the old way. So today with COVID-19, I see so many people who are working so hard, two jobs. I, I, I know um, we know my wife and I know a single mom who was working a job, was also driving as an Uber driver, right? Working hard, doing everything we've told her to do. And only for today with COVID and three week shutdown where everything has come crashing down. So what I see with COVID is I just see so many people who have given their life, who work so hard on a daily basis, who have bought in it to the dream of if you work hard and believe in yourself, you can achieve. 
And all of those people today are struggling and trying to survive because the system has failed them. So as I look at that and say, how do we rebuild things? Like how do we engage young people in school today and create an environment and education that really equips people with the skills to make it? Um, one thing I learned from Nigeria, my parents told me there was, um, Nigeria is a British colony, right? My parents said to me at a very young age that, hey, look, for you to make it, you have to learn the British system. This is not our system, right? So the schools we went to were based on the British system. That's everywhere in Nigeria. So the understanding for most of the people from Nigeria is education is the way out because for us to make it, we have to learn the system we have to live in. And I think the same thing goes for here in the U.S. is we have to communicate with young people that in order for them to generate wealth or achieve success, they have to learn the system that they live in and how to master that system. And I've been around schools enough. I work in schools every day. And um, we miss the boat when it comes to that. And we miss the boat when it comes to communicating the next step and really teaching young people how to excel in this system. Um, and a lot of times we, we, we try to get young people through with a mindset of just making it. And I, I'm sure Mr. Thompson and uh, Marlon will tell you this is, we were, we were able to make it because we believed that to make it, we had to work 10 times harder. Unfortunately, that message is not trickling down to young people today to let them know that for you to achieve success, you have to work 10 times harder or be willing to work 10 times harder. And you still might not be successful because that just gives you a chance to be successful. It doesn't guarantee success. So I just look at all of us today and say, we all started from zero. Um, and I know Marlon and um, Mr. Thompson, what would life be like if you had something given to you, handed down to you from a parent or from an uncle to get you started? Um, would you be way further ahead today than where you are? And just looking at those things and say, it's amazing to me. And I meet so many people the same um, way, right? So many people who started from zero, but we can't, we just seem to accept that and just seem to look at it as something that we can overcome. But that's not the norm. <laughs> you, know, you are not supposed to start from zero in this country. So I'll be quiet for a second, sorry. Yeah, I have to hop off, but I did want to add a thank you for your points. So I, I would like to say that I can't say I didn't come from anything, uh, but that um, I came from stability, not wealth, but stability. And I think that there's a difference there. Um, and just kind of highlighting what that looks like. So. Um, both of my parents went to college, but uh, on my mother's side, uh, she comes from, I mean, she grew up in a housing project as well and from sharecroppers. So people, a lot of them historically could not read. I know I have a great grandfather on my side who lost a lot of land because he just could not read. Um, so there's that part. And then on my dad's side, um, my great grandfather actually started his own real estate company in Louisiana. He was one of the first real estate brokers there. Unfortunately, um, when we think about kind of the differences, the person who actually gave him the loan to start that company, I went to school uh, with his great granddaughter. She is able to pursue a career as kind of an artist, um, whereas like me and my brother still have student loans that we have to pay off. So even though on paper it looked like, you know, we should have kind of had more wealth and been able to do more things and maybe we are ahead and maybe some other folks who identify as black in the US compared to people who are white who should have been in a similar position, we're still not nearly um, as close to being as where we could be. So I think in terms of how we manifest some of that, I think sometimes um, stability can be better than wealth uh, or equal to, but certainly to your point, Emil, I think wealth is the thing that really can kind of take you to the next level to pursue things that you otherwise might not. So I'll jump off Molly since uh, I'm gonna go. But oh, no, I appreciate no. your time. Um, I, I do want to swing to Marlon on that. Um, you know, Emil asked and Brianka just pointed out, um, sometimes even a generation's worth of success isn't enough to overcome some of the systemic barriers and, and structural issues. And, and Emil pointed out, sometimes you have to work twice, three times as hard to get half as far in the way that the kind of the system has been set up. What, what would you say to, to Brianka's point and to Emil's point that um, sometimes you can do all the right things and work really hard and maybe even have some assets on your side, it still doesn't work out. 
because because it's, it's not about to me. It's not about the the assets. The assets are nice. The resources are, not, are nice. If somebody hands them to you, but it doesn't matter if you don't have the knowledge to take care of those resources and maximize those resources. So, like me, the key component to wealth is is knowledge and understanding. What Mel said is, is what I what I feel like I've learned. I've I've learned about the the system that we live in in America, and I've been able to to navigate the system with my understanding and carve out my own path in it because I understand understand how it operates and understand how it functions and I know that you know it, it it's it pays more dividends to be an owner versus a consumer um, so I, everything that I do I try to make sure that I'm on the ownership side and I try to make sure that I'm you know uh, having assets and generating revenue versus having a bunch of expenditures and having more of my money going out it's all about what's going what's coming in you know because you can have a high value when it comes to dollars, but it doesn't matter if you have just as much going out. You know, how are you maximizing and holding on to what you do have? And then the knowledge and understanding of not just the system monetarily, but um, what Bianca said as well, just as, in terms of the stability in a household and, and family, that pays so much dividends in terms of that social, emotional capital where I'm able to cope and deal with the stressors of my life so I don't fold under the pressure because I've learned this on a day-to-day -day basis within the household that I live within. So for me, in every area, relationships, money, systems, it's, it's all about your knowledge and understanding because it does doesn't matter how much money you make or how many resources you have if you don't have the knowledge to maximize those things and invest and bring dividends to yourself. You know, and I think that sometimes we, we overlook that the, the, the fact that knowledge is power and the mind is our most valuable asset. You know, and we have to train our minds and how we think and how we react and how we behave. So that we can manifest what we want to have a see, what we want to see occur in our lives, you know. And, and in my path, like I realize that manifestation is possible through knowledge and understanding and self-discipline and self-control and through my work ethic. And I found that with work ethic and knowledge, I can create my own pathway and, and carve out whatever I want to have and see in this world. And those are the things that I try to pass on and teach not only to my boys. You know, my, my, my sons are, I have all three, I have three boys, six, four, and two. And for me, it's never too early to start learning. And I feel like every encounter, everything that we do on a day-to-day -day basis is an opportunity for learning. It's a teaching moment. And when I engage with youth, when I go to schools and I work with them on the high school, the elementary level, every encounter is real. Um, and it could be because it's all an opportunity for learning and you never know, you know, when that light is going to turn on for someone or, it, or when you're going to plant that seed and when it's going to take take root and sprout up and they get it and they understand it, you know, but it, it, it is us uh, having this knowledge for ourselves and making sure that we are passing it on to others, for me, is how we build generational community wealth. It sounds like a lot of what, a lot of what everyone is talking about is education. Education is very important, having the knowledge and having the power. But what you're talking about too, Marlon, Life. is financial literacy yes life it's a big part of uh all the things tie in together but financial literacy i often feel like we're missing that component of as emil said earlier how things work together knowing the system if we don't know the system if we don't know how to navigate as bianca said her her grandfather had land but couldn't read so he was people were able to take the land from them so it's about navigating the system and, and that financial literacy component that we need to build wealth. How do we help educate people on that piece? Because the the everyone wants the money, as you say, you you spend what you if you're spending what you're bringing in, you're not creating. You you may have money, but you're not creating wealth. How do we change that mindset from consumers to producers? Well, I, I think it's just mm -hmm. looking in the community and seeing what resources exist. You know, for, for me, one of the, one of the people that I, organizations I think about is, is INHP and their initiative with, with home ownership and how they're strategic about bringing folks along. It, it's through education, right? And they're bringing you to the table with lenders, but they're educating you first on understanding credit, understanding budgeting, all of these components that you need to have in place before you, know, you actually go to the table for ownership. You know, it's filling your mind up with the knowledge to be able to function once you do have the asset, you know. And I think that's so, so often that's where we fall behind. I know just as 
professional, as a former professional athlete, and when I was a young athlete, and not having a role model to teach me the fundamentals, fund the fundamentals, excuse me, of economics and financial literacy, I made numerous mistakes. But I made sure that you know I I've been the person that that doesn't repeat the mistakes. I I, I learn my lessons and I take my lumps and I move on and go forward with with those lessons. You know, but as individuals in our community, we have to look and see what resources are out here for us to tap into to help us gain and obtain the knowledge that we desire to get to where we want to be in terms of, of wealth. I have a question about financial literacy and kind of the knowledge required, because obviously I would agree with both of you. I think um, better literacy, better training, and also better representation in financial institutions and educational institutions of black leaders. And, and we've seen a couple comments in the thread about the importance of supporting black educators uh, so that they don't leave and, and paying them well so that they don't leave. And then in our poll earlier in the program, only 2% of our attendees have really ever seen a, a black leader with financial decision-making power at a bank or at a lender. So could the panelists reflect back to me, how do you change the infrastructure and teach about kind of the existing broken infrastructure, right? We're, we're teaching about a system that is kind of broken and stacked against lots of folks, a system that has things like redlining and discriminatory practices. So do you, you have ideas for teaching around the broken structure? And what are your ideas for changing the broken structure? And I, I'd also ask our folks in chat to weigh in. Osia, can I start with you? Sure. <laughs> well, I think as far as teaching goes, I definitely think part of my education came definitely from my dad. My dad talked about, um, he didn't want us to, to learn when he did in his 20s about, about being frugal, about um, not going out and spending all your money as soon as you get it, about putting up money, saving it for a rainy day. These kind of things were passed down to me. I passed them down to my son. I passed them, I passed them down to my daughter. Um, but I think sometimes we, we're doing that part, but we haven't, but we don't talk about the investment piece, the actual how do you invest in, in uh, businesses, how do, you, how do you go and buy stock? You know, we, 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 we talk about certain things, but we, we haven't got to the other part yet. That is where we start really building, and when you talk about ownership, um, creating your own business and passing that down, I think sometimes we're, we're all we want to do is work hard, go to work, work hard, buy a house you know, um, and, and we think we've done it. That's what we've done and we, we can pass that house down, but we don't think about what happens when your house is in disrepair and you need to get your house fixed. You know, those kind of things, I think sometimes we're talking big picture, but we haven't gotten to the details of really wealth building. So I think that's what we have to start thinking about as we, as we talk about wealth. And, and I don't know if any of you, if any of you guys now, it's just all you guys <laughs> can speak to how do we get to sharing the details of wealth building and wealth creating versus the big picture. Cause I think many of us have the idea, the big picture, but it's those getting there, the process part that we often um, are missing. And I'll start with you, Mr. Thompson, since you may have some of the answers to my question. Well, um, uh, yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's a topic that, that I love to, to talk about, really. So I'm, I'm certainly glad you, you directed it to me. And, and I'll start by saying a point you made about um, financial literacy. It, it's very important. I really think they need to start teaching it in kindergarten, preschool on up. We wait too late to teach that. But um, uh, when I got to Indianapolis, I, I was in debt. I had no savings. I came out here to take a job that paid a fraction of what I made in New York City. I made good money in New York, but I was in my 20s and I partied it up and I did not have it. And um, but I had a tremendous amount of knowledge, a lot of financial literacy, going to Columbia Business School. Um, and I had it from, from even before Columbia. But um, some key points I'll make, and we have limited time. 
I own and operate four companies. Those companies were originally bought from five different companies. So that's how they were created. One looks like it started organically, but it started out of the first company that I bought. And so I went to a white owned bank that I happened to be on the board of now. I was not on the board of that bank at that time, but I called up Mickey Maurer, who's a local business guy and let him know what my idea was and what business I was trying to buy. And two days later, Mickey said, you got the money. And um, he would loan me the money. So I had some of my own money. I had a lot of success at Mays Chemical, but I didn't have to use my money. I used bank money. And I bought the business the same way you buy a house. And you might say, well, um, well, what did you know about the business? Well, the business distributed pipe valves and fittings and related products. Well, I knew how to distribute products. That's what we did at Mays Chemical. We distributed chemicals, but distributing and selling to professional organizations, I knew how to do that. So I had the knowledge. I had the knowledge. You know, so, you know, that's what Marlon was talking about, the knowledge. I had it. And so I went to the bank and got the money. And I knew the business had the cash flow already that I needed to pay the debt. So all I had to do was add to the cash flow by bringing in additional customers and, and calling on additional, I knew how to sell. I had been selling all my life. So I knew how to sell and bring in new customers. And I had the products and the supply lines because the company I bought had authorized distributorships that it would take me years to get. But I bought the company and then paid the bank back in about 60 days, you know, and, you know, put money in my pocket. And then later on, bought another company. Now, the one thing I didn't do was go out and load up debt on a bunch of credit cards, buying a whole bunch of stuff that I did not need to impress a bunch of people that I do not like and that don't like me. I mean, and taking trips that I can't afford, I did not do that. And that's financial literacy. If I put it on a credit card, no matter how much it is, when that bill comes due, I'm paying the statement balance because I'm paying no interest. I'm not paying interest. Now I do pay interest on bank loans that I borrowed the money to buy a company. And when I buy the company, the company have cash flow to pay the employees, pay the rent and pay the bank. And then pay the vendors to buy the products that I need. And then the balance I, I can put in my pocket or I have control over doing what I want with. But buying businesses, you can buy them like you buy a house. It requires knowledge though. Don't just go out buying a business. You got to make sure you understand the cash flow and how you're going to enhance that cash flow to repay that debt. Someone made a comment earlier, I think it was Brianka before she left, about in the 70s, we studied business and to own businesses. In the 70s and the 60s, Black folks, we emphasized education and encouraged our kids to get an education, but we often talked about a few careers. And that might have been good then, but that's limiting. You know, you should be a doctor, lawyer, nurse, teacher. It was somewhat chauvinistic because you're directing the girls to be nurses and teachers and the boys to be doctors and lawyers when all four can be whatever they want in that mix. But you're talking about that from the standpoint of building wealth. You can look at the Forbes 400, the richest 400 people in the world. 
And you can look at it this year, last year, the year before, and the year before. And there's only two ways to get on that list. You're either an entrepreneur or you inherit the money. There is no other way. You may say, well, Oprah's a talk show host. Oprah is an entrepreneur. You may say Jay-Z, who's not quite there yet, but he will be. You may say Jay-Z's a rapper. Jay-Z's an entrepreneur. You may say Dr. So-and-so is a doctor. Dr. So-and-so started the chain of hospitals. And he's an entrepreneur or she's an entrepreneur. That, that's the only way to do it. I mean, you're, you're not going to do it any other way. Now, I'm not saying that everyone should aspire to the Forbes 400 because happiness is important. And so you got to do things that make you happy too. And you can have a comfortable life. And that's what you're really after. But we were teaching our kids wealth building without really talking about how you really build wealth. So when I go into schools and I talk to young kids, I tell them what a profession earns. So you got to do something to make you happy. And here's what it earns. Well, I thought that would pay this because I thought this. And I'm like, you thought wrong. Here's what that profession pays. Here's what this profession pays. And I let the young folks know that. And, um, and so th that's, that's very, very important. At the same time, I don't try to give them the impression that the more money you make, the happier you are. I was very happy when I was poor growing up in the projects, extremely happy. You know, and so happiness and joy, that's a whole different thing. Marlon talked about, you know, growing up and, and, and the blessing that he's gotten from God. And I'll say the same thing. That's where my joy comes from, hmm. you know, happiness. But I'm going to tell you this. I'd rather be rich and unhappy than poor and unhappy. I'd rather be rich and happy than poor and happy. I've been both. I've been poor and happy and I've been rich and happy. I prefer rich and happy. Now, I'm not going to mix the two things, happiness versus unhappiness, because all I want is joy, peace, and happiness. I mean, the money is, 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 is a far second thing. Um, but this whole notion of wealth building, I want to give others a, a, a chance to make closing comments. It's important, and it can't be done in one session, because there's so much work to do. But uh, I think you've heard some ideas and concepts throughout this talk. But I think, um, so to the whole panel and everybody listening, right, um, I get so much joy from just listening to um, Brother Thompson talk about, I mean, he just gave us, I'll pay for that session, right? Um, just some, some, some nuggets and some knowledge and just how he got started and how he bought a business. What happens is, um, so many young people hear Marlon's story or my story about playing sports. And a lot of young people believe if they work hard, they can make it to the NFL or NBA, and they should. It's their dream. But so many young people don't hear Mr. Thompson's story, right, to understand that they can do the same thing, and we don't glorify his story. Our stories get glorified. We will ESPN and we we'll read and kids read about it and they believe that story. And, and so many kids believe they can go to the, to the, to the NFL and NBA. So as we look at um, the, the simple things that we can do, systemic racism and systemic um, obstacles, they exist and they, they're going to exist. Um, I was listening to Charles Barkley the other day talk about that and say, you know what? Those things are there, right? But we still have to... Um, overcome we can't look at those things and blame those things so mr thompson and people like him have to be accessible to our young people we have to glorify the him as as heroes of our community because of what he has been able to achieve and tell his story just like we tell the story of lebron james and people have to believe that they can be the next mr thompson they have to believe that they can buy a business and understand that those things can happen. And um, 
so as we look at education and I'll speak from my point of view is innovation in education. How do we go about engaging and truly educate, inspiring learning? That's education is defined to me, teaching was defined to me as the ability to inspire learning. How do we do that with young people instead of waiting for finished products to walk through our doors? Understanding the young people that we get coming in our schools and then holding them accountable to excellence. Um, Marlon and I playing sports, you are not going to go out of practice without the expectation of excellence. But we need to have the same thing in our schools. We need to have the same thing with our young people. And we need to glorify people like Mr. Thompson who have a true American dream story that every young person in Indianapolis should know his story. So to me, those are the simple things I think we can, we can do. I like, I like looking at things as far as what are the simple things we need to do and what can we truly do? You know, we need to tell those stories to young people so young people know they can achieve. And we need to create environments that inspire learning and not wait for finished products to come in our doors. Thank you so much. Marlon, did you want to add anything before I, I turn it back to Ashia? I mean, I, I just, I, I agree with, you know, so much of what's been said, you know, um, I think we, we mentioned and talked about how do we change the system? And I think you change it from getting within it. And just as Emil said, you know, it, it's about what, what do we value and what do we glorify? You know, I, I I, I shake my head at, at, my, at times when people, you know, hold me up on a pedestal for being an athlete. And the male has it correct. Like John Thompson and his story and the story of entrepreneurship um, and ownership and the process to, to being that and going about it, like that's what needs to be told. Like that needs to be a tangible path to understand that that is reality. You know, it, it, it's not, you know, dunking a basketball or how, how far you can throw a football or playing baseball or running track. Those are great things. Those are pathways and those are avenues of social mobility. But there are other ways as well, you know, where you can have the freedom um, to create the path that you want. Um, but it starts with the knowledge and the understanding and, and us as a collective group, as leaders in the community and the media, we have to change the narrative and not have it just be speaking so loudly about the athlete or the entertainer, but about the entrepreneur, about the businessman or woman and how they've gone about attaining success. Um, and what John said, it's, it's not about success doesn't, success and happiness, you know, don't always go, go hand in hand. You know, I, I remember, you know, just being in the NFL, having more money than I do now, but not being happy, but but having a better understanding of who I am as a person now, having more direction in my life, that brings joy. Having a family brings joy. Having knowledge it has brought control, you know, and, and the fact that understanding through my knowledge and understanding of the system and the business and systems and processes in general, I have control of my destiny and it's just how I apply myself and what relationships I build to help fill in any gaps that I may have. Thank you so much, Marlon. Um, I'm going to just wrap up a couple comments from the chat and hand it back to Oshia for, for a final word. Um, thank you to the panel. It was really phenomenal. And thank you to everyone in chat. Uh, we'll be re uh, releasing the video of this session and a transcript and also highlighting the great ideas that have come from you in the audience around the importance of mentoring, around specific programs you'd like to see highlighted, around the idea, Ashley, I saw your idea about having something akin to a makerspace in public libraries that act as incubators and counselors for small businesses and also physical spaces where people can connect with folks like Mr. Thompson and like the rest of our panel. I think today we discovered that building wealth is a complex idea and a complicated idea and has as much to do with personal definitions of comfort and stability as it does uh, to do with any bank balance. And I think we recognize that there are structural and political barriers, and uh, hopefully we can have a second conversation to tackle those a little bit. Uh, but I am really grateful that all of you have taken the time to share your stories, because I think highlighting the stories of Black excellence and very diverse Black experiences, they are not monolithic, um, highlighting the talent in this city through this and the prior four programs is really important um, because I know personally I will never abide someone saying, well, I couldn't find a Black leader for my board. 
I couldn't find a black leader for my advisory committee. I couldn't find a black panelist uh, because we now have five sessions worth of amazing people just here in Indianapolis and they're, they're merely uh, one sample. Uh, so thank you to all of you. Oshia, I would love to hand it over to you to close us out and say goodbye today. Well, thank you so much, Molly. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to Mr. Thompson, Emil, uh, Marlon. Thank you, guys. I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, I've learned a lot. I feel like we, again, as usual, we're just like scratching the surface. There's so much more. I feel like we need to have some kind of like workshop for you guys to do like sessions <laughs> where you can share your information, your wealth of wealth of knowledge, as we're talking about wealth today. And, and to Marlon's point, I definitely feel story you're talking about highlighting athletes and entertainers and not highlighting stories like mr thompson and i feel like that is one of the things i love about doing what i do is i can highlight those stories i can share those stories because as mr thompson said earlier we only talked about so many jobs a lawyer doctor nurse teacher i never saw a journalist you know i didn't see a black journalist growing up i didn't know anyone who worked at a newspaper i just had somehow in my mind that's what i wanted to do um so, and I often try to make sure that other kids think about there are other jobs out here. They're not just these five jobs. You can do so many more. And the idea that there are even more jobs today. My son is in digital marketing. That didn't exist when I was in college. <laughs> you know, he's kind of created the space and I'm like digital marketing, wow. And for people that don't like telling my telling family members what he does, they're just like, now what do you do again? <laughs> what do you do? How do you do this? It's, and it's like you can create the idea of creating your own job. That was a newer thing to me once I got out of college and I was like, I could have become a consultant. I could do this and I can do that. Like, how do we do that? And I think that's something that we can we can have another workshop on is how to teach young people how to create these jobs for themselves, how, how to create these spaces. So I appreciate you guys so much. And Brianka, I know she had to leave, but I just appreciate learning so much and hearing and, and being able to impart wisdom. Um, and I think that we have many more conversations <laughs> about creating wealth. I think we're just scratching the surface. So again, thank you, Molly, New America. Thank you everyone for joining the panel. And I've really had a great time learning and I've been writing a lot of notes. I didn't get to everything, uh, <laughs> but maybe one day we'll come back to it and I, and I will. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Be on the lookout for our follow up email. All of you will receive a video, notes, and transcript. Thank you, as always, to our community partners at WFYI and to all of you for joining. Have a wonderful day and stay safe.